to save your soul from death It's all works righteousness, you know Can I manufacture grace Myself and I in some religious place By weeping hard on your face Or saying prayers to some dead saints, you know It's not to preach a little Self-flagellation till you bleed A sacred vows that you can't keep Mysteries and visions when you dream It's never a way that you must come To the Father through the Son Loving Him more than other loves Family, friends, yourself and a one By grace It is good to be with you again and to, today I want to deal with a difficult contrast. It is quite difficult and quite painful. I have dealt with very many contrasts before but this one is extremely painful. It is the contrast between what is the biblical gospel and what is heard in some evangelical circles and even from some famous evangelicals which I boldly call the modern evangelical lie on a article that I've written on our webpage the invincible gospel and the modern evangelical lie so to some extent that's the contrast I'm dealing with and it is painful because my background was thoroughly Catholic. From when I grew up, we prayed the rosary for as long as I could remember. We prayed to the saints. We did all the Catholic devotions. I was thoroughly trained uh, by nuns before I ever went to the Jesuits for all my elementary and secondary school. Uh, and I finished uh, with the Jesuits wanting to be a priest because I wanted to suffer and do penance and then I went into the Dominican order and I studied philosophy for three years, uh, theology for four, we did uh, the, binor, uh, min the Bible as a minor subject, more redaction, criticism and form criticism, more dissecting the Bible than studying the Bible as such. And I was then uh, ordained a priest. I went to Rome for final studies and then 21 years as a priest. I went door to door as a priest, which most priests don't do, but I was inviting people to church. What's the difference between when I went door to door as a priest and how I go door to door now? What is the difference? And that's another way of explaining what I'm trying to get across to you tonight. What is the essential gospel? Now how did I come to this? I came to it by, first of all, a disastrous accident in 1972 where I practically lost my life. I damaged my back spine and fractured my skull having fallen down 24 concrete steps. And then I uh, was taken unconscious to a hospital where I was three days and three nights unconscious. And when I did regain consciousness, I was in intense mental and physical pain. Not just physical pain, but my whole metabolism in, that's in your back spine and going up into your skull and brain. Uh, was all damaged, the, the, the whole mechanism by which you think and your emotions was all damaged and I was mentally in tremendous pain and four months later when I got out of the sanatorium I would still shake because of nervousness and I wondered if I died where would I have gone 
I'd always boast of what a good priest I was, but I never had peace with God. And I wondered where I'd gone. And I start reading the Bible, and particularly the book of Ephesians, and especially the first two chapters. Amen. Sometimes it was 20 times a day I would read chapter 1, chapter 2 of Ephesians. And I read, of course, Romans particularly, 3, 4, and 5. I read Isaiah 53. These were some of my specializations. The book of John and the, and the, the first letter of John. But I started to inquire, how could I be right before God? And I early on discovered, very early on, I discovered that Paul keeps saying that salvation is in Christ. I underlined in my Bible, the Jerusalem Catholic Bible, I underlined in the first two chapters, in Christ. Now it's said in different ways, in him, in whom, in the beloved. And I underlined it, it was 42 times in the first two, no it's 42 times in the whole book, 18 times in the first two chapters. And I said, this this is a key concept. So I go into the other letters of Paul. It's key the whole way through. Your life is hid with Christ in God. In, in Colossians. It's right the way through. So then I started to go to the John's Gospel. This is the record. That everlasting life is in him, in the Son. 1 John 5.11 I started to see that everlasting life is in Christ Jesus. And I had always thought it was inside me. We always talked about sanctifying grace being poured into our heart. And so this was a big turnaround that in the scripture, people are made holy inside themselves, but initially to be saved, it's in Christ. And that is brilliantly clear so I was to search for 14 years and that's a long time why did I take so so long 14 years of search a big part of it was the evangelists that I tuned into on the radio we could get some of the American famous evangelists by radio played on our AM radio and we could get some others by shortwave I always listen to shortwave and I listen to uh, some evangelists in Britain again by shortwave radio <coughs> and the message was nearly always accept Jesus into your heart or give your life to Jesus or uh, commit your life to Jesus and this was like the sales pitch at the end of the yeah. message. And I used to groan. And physically sometimes I nearly get sick. Because it was, it was the same words that we used in Catholicism. We were always talking about committing yourself, giving yourself. And now the, the evangelists were saying the same thing. And accept Jesus into your heart. We said that, meaning into the, in the communion bread, into your heart and into your stomach. And so it, it, this was really, really difficult. And I'd like you to understand from a Catholic point of view, if you're searching and you find that the message given by the evangelical is the same message as you're hearing in the Catholic Church, well, well so be it. You know, we're all one, you know. <laughs> so why, why, why should I budge? They're saying the same thing as we are. What's the difference? And that's what used to bother me. So the pain and agony was in looking at Catholicism and I, I cannot underestimate the pain and agony because there was tremendous pain and agony as I, dis, as I went through Catholic doctrine. The Mass I used to compare to a razor blade across my eye. And Mary uh, was quite difficult as well. Highly emotional and extremely painful. So I'm not saying that the Catholic things were not difficult. But what I'm speaking about now is the evangelical thing. Mm -hmm. now, that was the most painful because these men claimed to be 
Bible believers yeah. and some of them have very famous names and if they were saying this how can I be right with God? So I sent to the states to different ministries to get tracts uh, hoping that the tracts would be somewhat different. The tracts were the same only in print. It was, uh, it was the same thing about decision that you were, you were deciding and make, putting your stake in the ground whatever way it is. You were going to make your decision. This was your way. Reminded me something like Frank Sinatra, you know, I did it my way, you know. <laughs> how to be saved and know you did it your way. That was not the name of a track, but that was what it reminded me of because uh, um, it was around the same time that Frank Sinatra was doing the final curtain or a little bit after, but it, it did remind me of Frank Sinatra and I did it my way. If, if you can do it your way, well, better be Catholic because we do it with more show than all, <laughs> all of these evangelicals, you know. We have more style. Uh, so if you're going to do it your way, well, we do it better. We have more ritual going with it than, than you have. So I really struggled and that's what I want to deal with tonight. I was seeing that the famous Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And I would go back and read those verses after reading a tract or listening to a radio message and say, you know, why is this not emphasized? Why is this not said? It was in some tracts, but then it was, at the end it would be finally man's choice or man's way and not the, the conviction and seldom if ever was there mention of a word repentance yeah. or men being dead in trespasses and sins. That famous verse 1 of chapter 2, you being dead in trespasses and sins, I don't believe I ever saw ever in any tract. Mm -hmm. And I still collect tracts and uh, still listen to radio messages and it's seldom ever that you would hear that, you being dead in trespasses and sins. So, it's to see that the gospel is proclaimed. What did Paul say? He said, now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest. It's seen, it's brilliantly before mankind. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Christ Jesus, unto all them that believe there is no difference for all of sin, and come short of the glory of God. Yes. Being justified freely Amen. by His grace. Amen. The righteousness of God, a perfect life is lived. That's Jesus Christ's perfection. And it's upon all them that believe. It's resting on them. Credit it to them. Because it's His alone. And it, but it's credited to the believer. And I was beginning to see this and rejoice in Romans 3 that I just quoted. But no, I was being held down by a lot of evangelical ways of saying things mm -hmm. that just were not in line with the Word of God. And it's some of these things I want to deal with. How not to evangelize. First, before I get into the specifics, let me say how not to evangelize is to be silent and say, well, my Christian life is such a perfume that, you know, <laughs> that people will be drawn onto Christ. Or, you know, I'll, I'll live such a good Christian life that people will know what salvation is. We go and give the message. That is, it's, it's a commandment. Go ye is not a request. It is a commandment of God. And we go and we give the word in season and out of season. In coming here last night, I remember that on the plane from Syracuse, we were 25 minutes just sitting on the tarmac and it was... I, the, the hostess was standing just in front of us so I couldn't really talk to the people who were across the aisle who I discerned were Catholic and indeed they were but I talked anyway I said I've got to speak 
You know, the Lord says, you know, go and you go. And you say what you have to say. And I found great interest in this stuff. Under difficult circumstances. But you give the message and you leave the results to the Lord. Amen. I would be really surprised if Moses, who is the one that I witnessed to last night, is not saved. He said he's going to email me. And I would, he was really coming under conviction even towards the end of about 25 minutes of talking. But we do it. We don't be, we're not silent. That's the first, the first way not to evangelize is the hope that somehow our lives will be the gospel. Yeah. That's not what no. Christ Jesus says or what Amen. the gospels say. Now, how not to evangelize is not to use what is often ordinary parlance in some Christian circles. Quite ordinary is the phrase that has come here into the United States in about the last 50 years and has become fairly standard. This accept Jesus into your heart. Yeah. Now, why is that wrong? It's wrong because it's exactly backwards. Anything backwards is wrong. <laughs> It's that you may be accepted in him. That's Ephesians 1.6. It's that you may be right with God in Christ. And that the human heart is no place for Christ to come to. It's dead in trespasses and sins. Christ said it's from the human heart come all wickedness and he named the wickedness. No, the human heart is, is no place when it's unsaved and, and not born again. It's no place for Christ to come. And so, to say come into your heart is not biblical because of the way the Bible explains the heart. It is wicked, according to Jeremiah, and full of deceit. Yep. Totally wicked. Mm -hmm. And it's no place for Christ Jesus to come. It's that we are to be received into him or to be accepted, the exact word of Ephesians 1.6. This is the message that we, we see that salvation is in him and not this general way that it is very often explained. Right. And so we get rid of that terminology. Amen. And sometimes when I go door to door witnessing, I'll ask somebody, can you be accepted into Christ? Well, let's say, why? I say, well, we're all sinners. And We've all come short of the glory of God and unless we are in Him, we just can't stand before a holy God. That's right. we ex we, you cannot, cannot be accepted before God as you are in yourself. So this terminology is exactly backward. And it's really sad that it's on some of the leading evangelical web pages. I want to quote from one. And these are the exact words from one of our leading evangelical web pages. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Revelation 3.20 Jesus Christ wants to have a personal relationship with you. Picture, if you will, Jesus Christ standing at the door of your heart the door of your emotions, intellect and will. Invite him in. He is willing, he's waiting to receive you, to receive him into your heart and life. And then it goes on to assure a person that if you have said this prayer, that you have salvation. It goes on to give you an assurance because you've done it sincerely. Now that's a use of a Bible text, Revelation 3.20 so he's used the Bible verse but what's the Bible verse about? go to the Bible Amen. Three, uh, chapter 3 of Revelations beginning in 14 before you get to it, the church of the Laodiceans write who is he writing to? Sure. the church what's their condition? they're neither hot nor cold they're lukewarm Christians and it is awesome that Christ would want to come into their heart to sanctify them because they are wishy-washy, lukewarm Christians. But this is spoken to a Christian church. It is a sanctification text, not an evangelization text. 
It's a misuse of scripture. And you don't have to go to Bible college to know that you interpret something in context. Amen. The context is to the church people. We are talking about witnessing to the lost. And that's how sad it is that this is usually a very common way and it's something to be avoided because we're avoiding the key element that man is dead in trespasses and sins and so that and the opposite of that is that he needs the grace of God if he can't do anything God must be doing everything you know so so the opposite is God God's graciousness is magnified Amen. when we bring out the deadness of man we glorify the grace of God and if you start by saying accept Jesus into your heart you're presupposing at least some goodness mm -hmm. at least what the Greek mystics had a spark of goodness you have some goodness inside the human heart because you have to respond so there's some good in you so it's all a wrong premise and that's why it's deadly mm -hmm. it is really deadly and this is what we have to avoid we have to avoid this type of terminology because it's going back to salvation being a process you are doing this and then by the process of receiving him you are becoming supposed to becoming Christian but that's not how it is it's a one-time act of God Amen. that we are saved as we believe on Christ Jesus Amen. now it is interesting that the same web pages that say this type of a message are the same web pages that endorse evangelicals and Catholics together hmm. they're the same ones that are saying that we should fraternize with Catholics and work together with them on social issues and and evangelize with them instead of evangelize Catholics. so it's the same big names who have signed evangelicals and Catholics together the biggest one of course was Campus Crusade but also uh, the Chuck Colson's and the you know the of the world the, the same the same concept is this, the same type of evangelism goes hand in hand with a false idea of who Catholics are and you can see why because if, if you're giving the same type of message well you should join them but do not call them Christians and don't call yourself Christian if this is the way that you think that you're being saved because this message doesn't save anyone Amen. it gives you a bloated idea of who you are mm -hmm. then the message that is fairly often given is give Jesus control of your life it's like be nice give him control who worketh all things by the word of his by the word of his counts of his own will I got so excited I got caught, caught, caught away I know the verse by heart but who worketh all things by the counts of his will God is in control of everything you don't give him some sort of controlled behavior by which you're going to be right with him that is again opposite because God is in control and you do not hand him control of your life it again presupposes that you're in charge and that you have all, all your ducks in a row and everything going fine so that you can give him your controlled behavior that is not the way to evangelize Amen. give your life to Jesus is nearly as popular as accept Jesus into your heart give your life again it is so horrendous why it's the exact opposite the scripture says in Galatians 1 4 our Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God and our Father he gave his life for us we don't have anything to give so give your life to Jesus is the exact opposite to what we should be telling them we should be telling them the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus 
Romans 6.23. It's the gift of God. Yes, sir. We do not have anything to give. So to think that you have something to give and to tell this to a Catholic or any unsaved person is the idea that if you do so many good things or whatever, it will all add up. Our righteousness are filthy rags, the Lord says. So it's not anything that we give. Now I could go on giving, but I think you get the examples, but you get the general idea of the false message that emphasizes man's ability, man's ability to be in control, to give his life, make his decision or whatever on his own. And that's the, it's the, what man likes to hear, but it doesn't save, it doesn't convict of sin, righteousness and judgment and it doesn't bring the eternal life because it is not the biblical message. Now we've got to say what is the biblical message? What did Christ Jesus himself say? What does the apostles say? What did the pages of the New Testament say? The pages of the New Testament and Christ Jesus continually emphasize that people are commanded to believe. Christ Jesus summarized it when the Jews, who were like good Catholics or good religious people of any sort, when they said, what must we do that we may do the work of God? Like, what sort of things am I to do that I can be right with God? What must we do that we may do the work of God? The Jews asked Jesus. It's in John chapter 6, verse 28. Verse 29, Jesus replies, This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. It's God's work, so it's his grace or power that you believe. It's his commandment. And I use that very often. I use it many times when I'm witnessing door to door. I say, this is not an invitation. I say, this is a commandment. Christ Jesus said, this is the work of God. This is the Lord himself commanding you that you are to believe on him. To believe on him whom he has sent. That is as forceful as you can get. Paul and Silas to the jail keeper, Acts 16. Believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved, thou and thy household. Again a commandment. Believe on the Lord Jesus. That's where the gospel is at. That's the message of the scriptures, that people are commanded to believe. They are to believe on the Lord Jesus. They're not to look into their own hearts or their own self. They are to trust on Him. And that is the, the message. Christ Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say to you, He that believes on me has everlasting life. The assurance going with it that whoever believes on him has everlasting life. He that believes on the Son has everlasting life, has life, but he does not believe the wrath of God abides on him. It's not that you are neutral or that God loves you and has a plan for your life, you know, you're still okay if you, you know. <coughs> The wrath of God is on those who don't believe. So this is how serious is the command. That the wrath of God is like one day I was coming away from witnessing a man said, well, I'll think over it, you know, and I'll, you know, someday, maybe in the future. I said, the wrath of God is on you if you do not. It's not, God is not waiting for you. I said, his anger against sin Sin nature and your personal sin, his wrath is on you. And the only way is to trust what Christ Jesus did in all perfection and all righteousness so that you may be accepted in him and to be accepted in the beloved and to know the love of God. So it is a strong message but the scriptures are clear. It all focuses on he that believes has everlasting life he who does not believe is condemned the scriptures are equally forceful 
in emphasizing that it's God's gift or God's grace. There's a real tension between the fact that God's power saves you and the fact that you're commanded to do it. And I think that we can only, we can only uh, deal with the tension between the two strongest statements about the gospel in the scripture is by hiding behind the words of scripture because they're equally strong. You know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in the Christ Jesus. It's free, it's from God. That's utterly God. Utterly of God. Not of works as anyone should boast. Utterly God's doing. Even the faith itself is the gift of God. Utterly of God. Where you get these strong, strong texts emphasizing that only God's power can save. And that's what we tell the Catholic person and what we say to anybody now listening or here that it's only God that can save you. I was talking to Fernando, um, a Latino man, and uh, I told him, uh, you know, I said, I said, Fernando, it's God's commandment that you believe on him whom he sent, Christ Jesus. And he said, yes, but how, how do I do it? And I said, well, in actual fact, you can't do it. I said, you're dead in trespasses and sin. So he said, get out of here. He got up, sh shoved me out of his apartment together with the man I was with. And he came out after us, Sal Flores and myself, and he put his arms around and he said, I love you guys because you tell me the truth. Mm -hmm. So we went on telling him, yes, you are dead in trespass and sins, but God is gracious. Amen. Look to him and he will give you the grace. It's to get people looking to the power of God. And they know after they're saved that it was only God's doing, right. that they could never do it of themselves. Amen. So it's, it's getting people's eyes focused on the greatest Bible verse there is, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So to know that it's his love that initiated it all. It's his power to give you the gift of faith and to demonstrate Christ's righteousness to the world that there is one perfect and you are accepted in him, the one who fulfilled all righteousness. So this is the glorious tension. And there's some, there's some verses, I think, that really bring out these the tension I think it's it's good to memorize these verses for example John 1 chapter 1 and verses uh, 13, 12 and 13 for as many as received him to them gave he power to become sons of God even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, to those who receive him, and it tells you what receiving him means, who believe on his name, those who believe on him, those who believe on him, how? Who are, which were born not of blood, it's not family, not of the will of the flesh, it's not emotions, not whipping up emotions, nor of the will of man. It's not on your power within you, but of God. It's the will of God. It's God's power. So in, that, in those two verses you have balanced those who receive him, to all who receive him, who believe on his name, all who trust him. This is how they trust him by the will of God, the power of God. Mm -hmm. So in those two verses, it's all summarized. Paul summarized it many times, but I'll just give you one. Be it known to you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified. Amen. By who? By him. It's by his power, by him. 
all who believe, all that believe. So that simple phrase, by him, shows that that's how they believe. Simon Peter was explicit that we acquire it from God. This is so clear in his uh, second letter, the very first verse. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. How did you get it? You obtained it. Mm -hmm. God gave it to you. It's God given. So these are the things that you explain to people. You hide behind the words of scripture. I thank God that I've seen not only people saved in door to door witnessing but even in uh, witnessing when you do it in daily life. Like in a pharmacy, once we saw a man, was, I didn't start, it was another one of our um, workers who went uh, door to door and he invited me and I followed up on it a man in a pharmacy he got convicted and biblically saved gloriously and a lady in an Albertsons uh, in Portland, Oregon you know where you see people getting convicted in everyday life even if we never do like coming back from New York last year in the airplane uh, after having witnessed to uh, the stewardess who seemed to be standing up there doing nothing and uh, so I went up and gave her something to think about after witnessed her I got all pumped up and enthusiastic so I come back and I'm sitting beside this businessman on my right hand side I'm in the middle seat uh, then I started to say you know you've got to be right with God and you know that we're all sinners and he said stop Hold, hold a minute, hold a minute. And I said, okay, what, what is it? He said, I have a question for you. He said, do you think God's on my case? And I said, well, what? What do you mean? He said, well, as I got onto the plane, you see the lady over in the middle seat, in the aisle opposite, she gave me a tract. And he gave me the tract. <laughs> she gave me a tract. And he said, now, now you come with this. So, <laughs> you think God's on my case? And I said, yes, I do. <laughs> And uh, so I do. And, and I would be surprised if I don't see that man in glory land, you know, because uh, uh, that's what we do. That's, but we tell them what the scripture says. Amen. And we leave, we leave the results to God. Sometimes we, we will never know. We will never know until we reach the eternal glory with God. And then we will know and praise God that we will see those that the Lord use our, our witnessing to save them so we give them the words of scripture and we give it in such a way that we repeat often the very words of scripture and that's why you must have memorized it's, it's no use saying that uh, well you know, this is I think is what scripture says you give the words of scripture Amen. and you give them you know Wherever, wherever you are, the hairdresser or to the UPS man, they're the hardest people in the world, they're always in a desperate hurry. But wh whoever it is, uh, banks are really easy because they're trained to customer service and okay. they must be nice to you. So it's, it's, one, of the, it's a, uh, one of the easiest places. If you want to learn witnessing, well, just start in a bank. It's one of the best places to start. And you do meet a good many Catholics there too. And I found on the West Coast a lot of immigrants, a lot of people first time jobs working in the bank and very, very interesting because you start going into other languages. That's on the West Coast and probably not here, but banks are a notoriously good place to begin witnessing. Um, so we hide behind the words of scripture. Now what we must say in our presentations and what is sadly lacking in modern day evangelical circles is repentance. Faith and repentance go together. It's like a coin with two sides. You know, repent and believe was Jesus' first words about the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. The two things, it's a two-sided coin. And it is such that if we don't have repentance, we don't have genuine faith. That if 
you do trust on Christ Jesus, you are turning your mind and a complete turnaround in your life on your sins. He doesn't save you in your sins. He saves you from your sins. Amen. So this, is a, this has got to be preached and got to be in our witnessing because this is what is central. He came to call sinners to repentance. Except you repent, you likewise will perish. That Jesus Christ said in his great commission recorded 24 of Luke, that repentance and the remission of sin shall be preached in his name among all nations. So it's to be preached. I know when my wife comes back from the hairdresser, if she's mentioned repentance, I'll see it. There'll be a, there'll be a little gash out of this side or something, you know. And I'll say, Lynn, you, you told them to repent or something because there's a piece missing here that shouldn't be gone, you know. She has either said they're dead in sin or they mentioned repentance, which she's capable of doing and doing many times. But this is what we do. We mention repentance, that you must repent of your sin and that you must, as you trust in Christ Jesus, turn away from all wickedness and that see that you are a sinner. So we emphasize sin, sin nature, and uh, repenting of it. Sometimes it, I tell the people, you have a, a bad heart and a bad record. You know how to win friends and influence people. You know, you know. Look at a person say, you know, by the way, you have a bad record and a bad heart. Say, so you know, you have bad heart because we've all born with sinful nature and you have personal sin. Now it's not the easiest way to evangelize, but. This is real evangelism because we're telling a person now you've got to repent of sin. And that you do as you trust on God and the power comes from Him. When I trusted on Christ Jesus in my own life, finally at the end of the 14 years, it was the very next day alcohol was out of my life. Amen. very next day and I was imbibing quite strongly at that stage even though I was doing all my searching but it was what quieted my nerves. But it was, it was part of the repentance. It was getting rid of the vice of, of being addicted to alcohol. But the power comes from God, like grace. It's the same power that comes from God that we would repent. And this is so important. Now what is most difficult of all, and I want to say this with a, some empathy or feeling, is for Catholics, and we're talking especially about witnessing to Catholics, what's most difficult to repent of is religion. They have been taught from when they're small. It's what Holy Mother says. That Mother gives you the faith. Mother is the mother of your faith. It's an ecclesial act, it says in the New Catechism. Faith is an ecclesial act. She engenders and gives life to your faith. You trust because Mother Church has told you. As Mother Church has given you the way and the sacraments. And so, for a person to trust on Christ Jesus means giving up all the rituals and the sacraments of ways of getting to God. Even though they know they don't deliver. And most Catholics who are sincere know that it hasn't changed them. If you can get them to be honest, it doesn't change, it does not deliver, it doesn't make any difference. But it is most difficult because it's, it's in your blood, it's in, it's in your family, it's your heritage, and particularly if you come from Irish or Italian stock. You know, it's, 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 it's embedded into you. And this is where, with Catholics, we've got to say you've got to repent of your religion. Now, how do you do it? It is very difficult, but I have a scripture verse that I use, and it's John 8:24, where Christ is talking to equally sincere Pharisees mm -hmm. who love their tradition and love their way of doing things. He said, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. If they were to continue in their tradition, 
and continue in, in their establishing their own righteousness, Christ Jesus said, you'll die in your sins. So that's exactly what I say to Catholics. There was a one Mr. Bartling back in Portland and he told me I was born Catholic, I'll die Catholic, I go to Mass, all my friends are Catholic, my family is Catholic, and you can go on talking and I just am going to remain Catholic. And I said, Mr. Bartling, if you remain in your tradition, you will die in your sins. And he turned away and just left me. Then his son phoned and said, my dad is very upset. He said, he phoned me a few days ago and said, all last week he had difficult sleeping at night because of what you said to him. And I said, I don't like to deprive the man of sleep, but in some way I'm happy <laughs> that this is bothering him. You know, if it's bothering him, well, you know, you meant to be like Joshua who put in the sword. We put in the two-edged sword into people and turn it around to make it more difficult. So I say, if it's bothering him, good, because at least he's thinking. It wasn't very long afterwards that he got desperately sick, called the Providence Hospital uh, in, in Portland and who does he call for? Only me. And I go to see him and it was one of the most glorious things I've ever, ever experienced. I started telling him about being a sinner and trusting in Christ and Christ alone and he's just saying yes and there's a little tear coming out of his left eye I can still see it to this day. He was trusting in Christ and Christ alone. It was really precious to see this, but it was a strong word beforehand. It was telling him that he would die in his sins. And that's not a nice word to say. You know, it's, it's hard. It is hard. Uh, if this applies to anybody here now, I'm saying it again. You will die in your sins. I'm trying to make it nice, but it's strong, but it's true. You go to hell for all eternity. And it's particularly the religious hypocrisy that Christ hates. He called the Pharisees whited sepulchres. That was his evangelism of them. Whited sepulchres. Brood of vipers. I mean, all types of ways to show them that all their religiosity adds up to insulting God. Therefore, you will die in your sins because it does not honor God. And this is what we have to do, even though it's difficult. So, I ask you then, particularly for devout Catholics and those who say, I won't listen to you, you know. Uh, sometimes they say to me, now, well, bless you anyway. And, and some of them will say, well, we accept you, why don't you accept us? I say, I don't accept your blessing. I'm not taking any blessing. And I said... Uh, you are not blessed. I said, you will die in your sins. Um, it's hard. I did it in the streets of Denver when the last Pope was there, 93. I was out witnessing with a group of men and some Catholic people would say, you know, I take all that, take those tracks, take that stuff. And I'd say, you'll die in your sins. We did see one glorious conversion there. I, don't, I trust, trust to God there were others. But we did see one glorious one and on the streets of Denver, 93. But you tell Catholics that because you love them. And if Christ found that the best way to witness to the devout Pharisees, we should use it the way to witness to devout Catholics. Amen. Because it's the same thing, establishing your own righteousness, and it's also relying on tradition as well as scripture, the written word of God. The exact same two pieces of Phariseeism is what's in Catholicism. Mm. Catholics say it's Bible plus tradition, and the, the righteousness is the righteousness that they say comes through the sacraments. And so they establish their own righteousness because it's their own sacraments. So it's the exact same as Phariseeism, and we deal with it as Christ Jesus would deal with it. Now, it is the emphasis of Scripture that I really want to deal with in this last portion because 
what is primary in scripture? What is central to scripture? What is cent should be central to our witnessing? Central to scripture is the holiness of God. Amen. What is of great importance in the scripture said twice. Verily, verily, I say to you. Amen, amen, I say to you. It's said twice. But there's only one item that is said thrice, three times in Scripture. Only one, and it's an attribute of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. There is none like the Lord. There is none like He. The holiness of God is what is central to Scripture. And that has got to come into our witnessing. I really recommend questions like Christ Jesus had in witnessing, that we ask questions. And one on the holiness of God, I, I recommend. In coming out of the supermarket, uh, my favorite question is, uh, first of all, as an introduction to it, what is your goal in life? And it's usually a young girl, sometimes it's a man, but I say, what's your goal in life? They say, well, you know, I want to get married and settle down. I'm also going to college and study. And I say, oh, that is good. What is your goal before the all-holy God? It's interesting. Interesting, interesting. I dare say nobody's ever asked the question before. You know, it's not a... Uh, interesting answers, interesting answers. Uh, it is a question that is not difficult, it's not offensive. You've asked them about what's the goal in life before you ask it, and it can get some very, very interesting replies. But it's majoring on what the Bible majors, the holiness of God. What is your goal before the all-holy God? They say, well, you know, I tried to go to Mass, or if it's somebody else, well, I go to church. When you show them that that doesn't measure up to the holiness of God, you've got to... Uh, it, it, it's, that does not measure up anything we do. And it comes to what Christ did, and his establishing all righteousness, and he being the righteousness of God manifest. God, Christ Jesus' faithfulness is perfect, Fidelity and obedience and his perfect sacrifice. It comes to that because only that matches the holiness of God and only that is the gospel. So I recommend this as a question and I think that it is really important. You can put it some other ways. To my sister in Ireland, uh, my eldest sister, I said to her, why did the sinless, spotless Christ have to die on the cross? And she told me it was a very painful question and she'd never considered it before. And she couldn't answer and then I started to speak back to her. I said, just as you have a red blouse on and the red blouse covers your body, I said, unless you are covered with the blood of Christ Jesus to take away your sin and with his righteousness to stand before the all holy God, you can never be right with God. So I went from there into the gospel. But that's the, when you, in the back of your mind you know you're trying to talk about the holiness of God. You ask questions that bring up that. Another way of putting it is God is all holy and we are all sinners. How, how can we ever be right with God? Now I recommend these as the essential questions and not the question that so many ask, if you're to die today, and how would you get into God's heaven? Why? Because that's centered on man. How can man be happy in this life? Go to Burger King, and, you know, or whatever, I shouldn't be advertising. But, you know, how can, how can you be happy in this life and be happy in the life to come? You know, it's not that. It's the center on the holiness of God. How can we be right before God? Because God is all holy. And that's what I end with. God is the all holy one. Amen. And if you're listening and you realize that God is the all holy one, know that there is one to whom you can run. The Apostle Paul said that I may win him 
And that I may be found in him, not having my own righteousness, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which of faith of Christ Jesus, that you may be found in him. To be found in Christ Jesus is to trust in him. And that is my plea. Trust him and know the joy, unspeakable and full of glory. And the joy it is to have peace with God and the assurance that you have eternal life. The joy it is to know that the all-holy God is also your Abba Father. Amen. That you can say at night, Abba Father, I rest in you. That you can call the all-holy God Abba Father because you are accepted into Christ. And it is his commandment that you believe on him. Do this and you shall live. Amen and amen. amen. Praise God. Praise amen. God.